All right, scholars, welcome back. Um, we're going to finish up chapter nine, um, motivation and emotions, with uh, talking about the emotional experience and uh, the different elements of the emotional experience. Um, then we'll end uh, in this chapter for uh, for good. But again, the 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 connection that we'll talk about with emotion and uh, motivation are uh, they work hand in hand. We talked about um, the drive, the internal state, the tension that we have on the inside that forces us to move and do things. We talked about the incentive theory, uh, which is that external stimuli that help us and reward us for, uh, for doing certain things. Um, we also talked about those three major, three common motives. Uh, we talked about first, um, you know, the motivation of hunger. We talked about the biological piece. We talked about the uh, the social experience and the social um, influences um, to hunger. We talked about obesity uh, and, and how food and obesity play, or play a role together. Uh, and then we talked about sex, the sexual experience, the human sexual response. Um, and then the last thing we talked about was the motivation to achieve and the importance of motivation and how that's going to help shape um, our success um, in the long run. We talked about how those with higher motivations to achieve, the higher need for motivation to achieve, usually work a lot harder um, at tasks, uh, usually delay the gratification, and it's correlated with higher educational attainment and also um, job success and earning a higher income as well. So, you know, there are internal factors. There are also those situational factors that we also talked about that uh, lead to uh, our uh, motivation to achieve something, right? We talked about the, uh, the individual's motivation to succeed, right? Their individual need to succeed. We talked about the, um, the you know, the incentive, right? The incentive value, is it valuable to me to achieve something or not? And then we also talked about the ease or the difficulty in achieving something. Is it something that I can easily achieve or is it something that's really, really hard for me to achieve? And, you know, if it's something that's really, really hard, I'm probably not going to be motivated to do it. If it's a little too easy, I'm still probably going to be motivated to do it. But if it's kind of a moderate uh, difficulty, then I'm probably more likely to do it. Um, and then this incentive value has to be really, really high for me to want to move and do something to achieve. Okay? But again, the emotional experience. Um, we'll, we'll finish off again. You know, just as a review, uh, we'll finish off on the emotional experience. Okay. So, you know, what, what are the um, components? We'll talk about the different components of emotion. But emotion is any subjective uh, conscious experience. So the conscious experience is the cognitive. We'll talk about the uh, bodily arousal that is associated with emotion, which is the physiological component. And then we'll finish off with the overt expression mainly in facial expression um, and behavior. And uh, so those three components are really, really pivotal. And those, uh, they, they are important to the, how we experience emotion, why we experience emotion in different ways. But emotions, just like motivation, um, are extremely essential to our ability to function. And they motivate us uh, to they help us in relationships. Uh, they form the foundation of our morality, meaning if we do something wrong, then we feel bad for it, we feel guilt, we feel shame. Um, if we achieve something really, really great and, you know, and, and do something with integrity, then we have a sense of pride when we do something right. Um, and again, all of that helps to motivate us uh, to do certain things and to behave in certain ways. Uh, the cognitive component of uh, emotion is that we'll call it the subjective experience. Everyone has a different experience uh, we can be in the same room, watch the same movie in a movie theater and have very different experiences uh, when we watch it. Some of us may be elated. Some of us may be sad. Some of us may be very indifferent emotionally. Right. But again, everyone we talk about individual differences. Everyone has a very subjective conscious experience of their emotions and what they experience. Some people are um, when we talked about the big five, the personality. Some people are, when we talk about neuroticism, some people are really neurotic and are really, really high strung. You think the worst, um, have a lot of anxiety associated with things in their environment. Some people are really, really low laid back. Um, some people have are really extroverted and so they don't get a lot of anxiety and fear when it comes to meeting new people. Those who are more introverted may experience a lot more anxiety 
uh, a lot more fear when it comes to meeting someone new. Um, again, the cognitive component, really highly subjective. And so we have to rely on um, subjects, verbal reports of what they're experiencing in a certain moment, right? So if you're interviewing someone after um, maybe a big performance and you ask them how they're feeling, you know, what is your, what are your feelings? What are your emotions at this current moment? They, you have to rely on them to say, oh, I'm, I'm really proud. I'm really happy, really elated um, about the experience, right? Um, so we can't, get into someone's mind and, and understand what they're feeling at a particular time. Um, there are efforts to predict um, our e reactions to uh, future events, and that's what we call effective forecasting. So, you know, many people are uh, uh, pretty accurate in, you know, predicting, you know, what they may feel negative or positive about a situation. If you graduate from college, you know, we can predict, okay, I'm probably going to be pretty excited about it. Um, if you fail a class, you know, I'm probably going to be really disappointed about that, right? But we're almost always way off when we predict the duration and the intensity of the emotion and how long, uh, again, that's going to last, right? So there was a study that was done um, on a college campus, and they were asking students, you know, how do you think you would feel um, if you got the dorm, you know, different dorms, uh, different qualities of dorms. And, you know, we're like, what what would happen if you got the dorm that you wanted versus not getting the dorm you wanted? And how do you think you'd feel, right? Uh, and, you know, the intensity, you know, they rated it at, the, at that time, right? And then, you know, when they, you know, several, several, I guess, several months after, they asked them again, you know, how they felt. And many of them, few months later didn't have the same feeling that they felt that they think they thought they would feel. They thought they would be really, really elated, really, really happy even months later. But when they asked them later, the feeling was gone. Um, and then those who were maybe disappointed initially, they were no longer disappointed by not getting uh, the room assignment that they wanted. Same thing with, uh, you know, someone got a job, the job, their dream job, and they asked them, you know, how do you feel five months later? And they don't feel any different, right? It's, they, they were maybe elated at the beginning and then it didn't last, they kind of faded. Or someone who lost their job, you know, initially they were pretty pretty down about it, disappointed. And then, you know, that emotion kind of faded away. Uh, so again, our emotions don't last as long as we think they will. And the intensity of them is not as high as they might be. You know, young people have this, uh, this intensity when they feel like they, when they break up with someone, oh man, I'm so sad, this is gonna be the worst time of my life and then you know, ask them two weeks later and it's like you know it's all good whatever right so you know we can forecast you know how we might feel negative or positive emotions uh but the duration and the intensity is something that we can't predict uh especially when it comes to bad or good events that happen okay uh, this is one thing i'd like to share um the emotion will is extremely important um you know many of us we look at the core uh, emotions we'll talk about and we can talk about evolution. What are the primary emotions that we have? Uh, and there are three theorists who, who say that we have around eight to 10 main or primary emotions. And here are one, this is what, four, seven emotions. Here are some of the, the primary emotions that we have. Um, but when you look at the emotion wheel, the core emotions, the primary emotions, these aren't enough to explain how we feel in certain situations. And I like to use the emotion wheel, uh, especially with younger people, because uh, say we're angry, but anger is, is such a dynamic emotion. There's so many other emotions that are associated with anger. And maybe I'm not really angry. Maybe I'm bitter about something. Or maybe I feel violated about something. Uh, maybe I'm just frustrated and annoyed by uh, my younger brother or my boyfriend, right? Maybe I'm not really angry, but I'm just frustrated, right? So it's important to use the proper term, right? If we can identify the emotion, identify it, and then call it out, then, then we can take control of that emotion. But if we just say we're bad, uh, we're surprised, and we don't add any, any nuances to that, then we're not really speaking to the emotion that we're actually feeling. Right. If we're really just dismayed or shocked, 
then that's more accurate. And we can call that out, then we can control the emotions a lot better. And when we talk about emotional intelligence, this is a part of it. Being able to identify the emotion and being able to call it out and being able to control it. And not only control your own emotion, be in control of your own emotions, but also be able to understand what somebody else might feel an emotion. Maybe someone else might feel uh, violated or jealous, right? And I'm able to sense that in someone else. That's more emotional intelligence. Being able to be in control of our own emotions, meaning I know what emotions I'm feeling, and then also be able to understand someone else's emotions uh, and read those emotions uh, when someone is, is, is exhibiting them. Okay. So we talked about the, um, the cognitive piece, right? the cognitive component. This is the physiological component. The physiological component has to do with how our body responds to emotion. And we'll talk about um, different ways, right? So we'll talk about the uh, different theories that are associated with our physiological response to uh, emotion. But the autonomic arousal that we get when uh, we are and have emotions is really, really important. So uh, the autonomic arousal, any physiological involuntary response associated, associated with emotion. Uh, it occurs through the actions of the autonomic nervous system. If you remember and recall those two systems, you got the parasympathetic and you got the um, sympathetic nervous system, right? And those two things are, uh, are heightened. The sympathetic is really, really, when you're really aroused or really emotionally charged, uh, you you got that fight or flight response, and your parasympathetic is when you're in recovery, right? The digestive, you're in recovery, you're trying to rest, you're trying to get back to the kind of that equilibrium state, right? But the connection between the emotion and the autonomic arousal, uh, it provides the, the basis for the polygraph test, uh, or what some people say is the lie detector. I don't like to call it a lie detector test. I like, I like to call it a polygraph test because lie detector you can't necessarily detect a lie. All you're detecting is an autonomic or a physiological response to the emotion that someone is experiencing. And we like to think that when someone is experiencing or telling a lie, they're experiencing an, an, a specific emotion that is giving them maybe anxiety or fear uh, response, which then gives us a, a different physiological response. Um, you know, the polygraph test was invented by a gentleman named uh, William Marston. Okay. And he's also responsible, fun fact, for uh, coming up with the character uh, Wonder Woman, which is an interesting fact. Um, but he's a psychologist. He invented it to, again, be able to determine the different physiological responses that are associated with different emotions uh, that we have in our, and we experience in our emotion or in our, in our life. Um, the polygraph test uh, measures certain physiological responses like breathing rate, you know, our pulse rate. Um, our blood pressure or gal galvanic uh, skin response, which is your perspiration. Um, so when you when we begin to sweat, there is a electrical activity that's given off uh, through sweat, and the uh, machine is able to pick up on uh, that sweat response with electrical activity uh, with the, the monitor of the electrical, electrical activity on our, on our skin, <laughs> right? But again, it's showing that connection, right? So when people lie, Usually there's fear, there's uh, an increase in heart rate, there's anxiety, uh, your, your breathing rate increases. And so when you're telling a lie, that's usually what happens. And so they say when, when that happens, uh, the machine can pick up on uh, any change uh, in your physiological responses in those, those different areas. Okay. This next video uh, gives you an explanation of what was being measured, kind of gives you an idea of what, uh, what you'll see and uh, the different uh, activity that you'll see. Um, the different lines that you see here are associated with, uh, you know, various um, physiological responses. So this might be breathing right, right. This might be uh, perspiration. You have uh, uh, your pulse, uh, the gal galvanic skin response. All of these different areas are showing, um, you know, the different electrical activity and uh, the different activity in those different physiological measures there. But again, I, I'll post it all these. I'll put all of these in in the description. Um, uh, in the description below. Okay. Uh, the physiological component is also related to um, the brain and how the brain uh, is associated with our emotional uh, response. Um, the limbic system is considered the 
a really important seed in emotions in our brain. Uh, the amygdala, the fear response, and the other adjacent structures, the limbic system, hypothalamus, all of these uh, have the, the neural circuitry that are responsible for our emotions and what controls our emotions. And we talked about um, the different structures and how they don't necessarily, um, uh, are not necessarily responsible solely for our emotions, but those neural circuits is really what, what's playing the biggest role uh, in how we uh, understand and experience emotion. So the amygdala is that central processing station for emotions, and it, it sends uh, these signals to other parts of the brain um, so that we respond in a way uh, physiologically and behaviorally um, to um, to respond to emotion. Okay? Uh, but again, it plays a central role in the acquisition of condition, condition fear, excuse me. All right, so when you see something that's fearful, your amygdala is uh, activated, the neural circuitry in your amygdala is, acu is activated, and it's telling you, okay, I see a snake, let me do something really quickly to remove myself from that situation, run, kill it, whatever it is, so that I remove myself um, or remove the, the stimulus from, uh, from that fear, right? And when we are fearful, right, that sympathetic nervous system is activated, and heart rate, perspiration, pulse, everything begins to, pupils dilate, all those things happen uh, almost in an instant, automatically. Um, again, we talked about autonomic system, almost happen automatically, those hormones are released and we act uh, in a certain way. Okay. Uh, the behavioral component um, to emotion is extremely important because uh, emotions are expressed through our body language um, and other nonverbal behavior, right? So we don't have to really say anything to show people that we are feeling a certain way. Um, a lot of our facial expressions uh, give a lot of our uh, give a lot of our emotions away instantly, right? Um, it can re can reveal um, a variety of our basic emotions: fear, anger, happiness, surprise, disgust, sadness. Um, you can look at someone's face and instantly see what's going on in their mind. Um, and uh, facial expressions go, again, various emotions are largely innate. Uh, when we talk about the innate, those who um, are, are, are born blind, uh, they've never seen facial expressions. If they're, if they're angry, if they're happy, if they're fearful, you will see their facial expressions. They will match someone who, uh, who's been, who was born with sight, right? Because it's innate. Right? It's the facial expressions that we see, uh, that we feel, they're innate across cultures, across genders, uh, they are innate. And uh, one of the proponents of uh, how facial expressions are tied to emotions is the facial feedback hypothesis. And this facial feedback hypothesis um, asserts that our facial muscles send signals to our brain and uh, that these signals help the brain recognize uh, the emotion that one is experiencing. So if I frown up, that gives me and sends my brain a signal that I'm angry, right? That's why it's really important. And we'll talk about um, how, you know, when you are down and sad, right? Smile, you know, it gives you the emotion of happiness. And it may not, you know, it, it may feel fake, but our, our brains are kind of tied to our facial expression. They're tied to the muscles in our face. So it's really, really important. There are studies that have shown that those who are experiencing depression, um, they usually have this really, really down, down look, right? Really, really frowned up face. And they give Botox in different portions of the, of the face to relax the face in a different way. And that has reduced uh, the, the incidence of depression and the feelings of depression in, in some of the patients. And so it is and has um, uh, given evidence um, to the fact that our facial expressions do go hand in hand with our emotions. So facial expressions are really, really important. They show things to other people, but they also communicate things in our brain that help us to either feel down, or sad, or happy. Uh, so smile. Whenever you feel down, smile. Try to smile as best you can because it is doing something and improving your mood in a, in a really uh, important way. Okay. When we talk about the cultural elements, again, um, cross-cultural agreement 
is found in the identification of many of the different emotions based on facial expression, happiness, sadness, anger, fear. So you can go to Ethiopia and someone who's smiling, you can see it, you know they're happy. When someone is sad, you can see sadness. And, and so that, that kind of uh, also supports um, the innateness of facial expressions and how individuals are innately frowning when they're sad or happy mad and smiling when they're happy. They have this shocked look when they're really surprised. Um, and those cognitive appraisals, again, they lead to certain emotions, right? We can look at it, we can see it. Um, and it's really, really important that we can use those things in a really, really important way. Like I talked about before, if I'm feeling sad or, or feeling down, smile, right? Put a smile on your face and it makes you feel a little better. It doesn't take the sadness or the hurt away, but it does make you feel a little better. There may be a little uh, a little cultural uh, variance in kind of the physiological arousal, arousal that accompanies emotional experiences, but not by much, not by much. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about being afraid, I might not be afraid of, uh, you know, certain things. Other persons in other countries may not be afraid of snakes and other animals. I might be. Um, the way I experience sadness may not be the same uh, versus someone else in another country, another culture. But it's really depending on, you know, our lived experiences. Again, and these are all subjective based based on our experiences and our culture at, at times. Um, and then some, some curious question, the assertion that facial expressions of emotion transcend culture. Um, but evidence is really beginning to show and has shown that um, facial expressions do uh, across culture uh, explain uh, explain why uh, you know the connection between our muscle muscles and our and our face and the signal that sends to our brain are pretty innate uh, and how they how they are. Okay. Um, you know, here's some other cross cultural differences in the emotional experiences. Um, there are um, some variations in how um, cultures categorize the emotions, right? Um, some cultures have no word to correspond with sadness, depression, anxiety, uh, or remorse, um, right? So when we talked about um, the uh, linguistic relativity, you know, where our language kind of uh, influences how we think, um, our culture also influences how we how we experience emotion. And so that, I, I would agree, you know, individuals who, um, there are some cultures who are a lot happier than we are, Right. There's some, you know, some people in the Western world who are just don't experience happiness in the same way, right? So if, you know, some cultures have no word for sadness, that means their their level of happiness might be a lot higher. They don't experience a lot of stress and anxiety uh, because they're living in a, in, a, in a, maybe they're living in a more free, more carefree environment, right? Um, so they might not experience uh, a lot of things. Whereas in the Western culture, we really have high arousal, we're really stressed because we have this really high need for uh, intention, for achievement, um, this high attention to, to gain affiliation and belonging. Um, other cultures, that may not be uh, the same case. Okay? Uh, but there are some cultural norms that, again, regulate um, how we express emotions. Um, you know, so we're really, really high strung. Um, you know, we have, we wear our emotions on our sleeve a lot of times. And again, emotions really are really consistent with the culture's values. Uh, you know, they tend to be more prevalent for more intensity and less intensity of different emotions as well. Um, so, you know, cultures um, do dictate and our lived experiences dictate how we experience our emotions and what we experience uh, as a people. All right, so we'll talk about um, the theories of emotion and then we'll end here. But there are three theories of emotion that we'll talk about. And uh, the first one that we'll describe is what we call the James Lang theory. The James Lang theory says that the conscious experience of emotion results from um, autonomic arousal, right? So it says that the arousal we feel, right? So if my heart rate goes up, my pulse rate goes up, uh, I start to perspire, that must mean that I am anxious, right? So it says that the different patterns of autonomic activation lead to the experience of different emotions. So if I get butterflies in my stomach and I'm really, really uh, excited in the inside, 
that, that means I'm surprised. That means I'm happy, right? Um, so it says, supposedly, you can distinguish between emotions based on the different physical reactions they experience. That was not the case many times because some physical responses and reactions to certain things are the same based on, you know, certain emotions, right? Ang anxiety, surprise, and happiness might all have similar physical reactions, right? So that was kind of debunked um, and, and not supported as heavily. The canon Bard theory says that our physiological arousal can occur without the experience of emotion. And so this says that, you know, what if I'm working out really strenuous workout activity, I'm perspiring, heart rates up, pulse rates up, all of those things are happening, but I'm not really experiencing the emotion that's working out, right? So again, that is kind of against what um, the James Lang theory is. It also says that the emotions, they occur, occur excuse me, when the thalamus sends those signals, right? Because the thalamus has been known to be the kind of the, uh, the control center and it sends signals to certain parts of the brain. So it says that the thalamus sends signals uh, simultaneously to the cortex and the autonomic nervous system at the same time. So when we uh, are experiencing emotion, the conscious experience is being evaluated. So fear or whatever it is and fear and whatever emotion and autonomic nervous system is, is associated with fear work together. Or the thalamus is sending that signal to both places and that's our, that's our experience. And then the last theory we'll talk about is the Shatter's uh, tooth factor theory. And this kind of combines the two theories. Um, it says that when we look at a situational cue, the situational cue tells us how we should be differentiating between alternative emotions, right? So if I'm in a funeral and I feel, you know, really down on the inside, then it must be sadness, it must be grief, right? And so that's my kind of interpretation based on where I am. If I'm at a party and I feel I have this really, really upbeat feeling on the inside, my, you know, the, the autonomic arousal on the inside is really, really high, then I must be excited. I must be happy. I must be surprised. Right. So he agrees with the James Lang theory that, you know, emotion can be inferred from arousal. But he also says that the situational context also tells us why we should be feeling a certain way. Right. And he agrees that those different emotions um, are kind of, again, those indistinguishable patterns of arousal. Right. There are some different emotions that yield kind of these patterns of arousal that we just can't make, can't, can't, can't distinguish between, between them at all. Right. So if we can't distinguish between them, then we have to use those cues in order for us to figure out what, what's going on. So here's an example on the right hand side. It says, Imagine you're alone in a dark parking lot, walking towards your car. A strange man suddenly emerges from a nearby grove of trees and rapidly approaches, right? So the first thing you see, right, you're the context, the situational cues. You see a strange man walking towards you. As that happens, your heart is racing and you begin to tremble, right? So if your heart is racing, you've got a rapid heart rate and you're trembling or caused by fear, right, then you say that you're frightened. Right. So you see something, your body begins to respond, your cognitive response is, OK, since this is happening, I've seen this happen again. You know, my, auto, my autonomic response is I'm trembling. My heart is racing. I must be frightened. Right. That is in and of itself. That does happen. Right. But there is again, there's so much complexity to what we experience. There is a, a cognitive piece like we talked about and uh uh, the autonomic or the physiological response is a combination that happens almost instantly. Um, so, you know, this label might be, it might be work. It might, it might be that might be what's happening, right? But again, this is probably the most robust because it's combining the two theories together, and it is explaining a lot about how we feel based on our context, right? If I'm uh, at a graduation, and you know, I'm about to give a speech, right? Maybe it's not being frightened because I'm going to experience a rapid heart rate and I'm trembling a little bit, but maybe it's not a rapid heart rate. Maybe it's just I'm anxious because I'm about to speak, right? So the situational cues and we are able to differentiate between those emotions based on 
um, those cues, and that, that seems to seem to track in the right direction. Um, he reconciles uh, again the views arguing that people look to external rather than internal cues uh, to adventure to initiate. So again, those external cues play a big role. Okay. So here are just the four emotions, uh, the, the four theories of emotions. You have the common sense theory, right? You see the stimulus. Yeah, yeah, your conscious feeling is fear, and then you have it. so you you cognitively say I'm fearful, and then your body responds. Okay, the James Lang theory, the theory says that uh, you have this uh, stimulus, you have this autonomic response, shocked and fearful, and then your conscious feeling I'm fearful. Right, so you know this one is a little less natural. Right, the Cannon Bar Bar theory says the dog makes me tremble and feel afraid. Right. So the amygdala says, OK, man, yeah, I'm feeling afraid. And it sends a, it sends a message to the conscious feeling and the autonomic arousal. Oh, I feel afraid. And then the second one says, I label my extremely fear as fear because I praise the situation as dangerous. So the dog is barking at me, the autonomic arousal then the appraisal. OK, now I'm fearful. Right. So all of these do explain it in a way. Right. This one's a little less natural than these other two. Um, but these two working together, even with this one, um, kind of explain, you know, how we experience emotion, um, you know, in in a uh, in an autonomic kind of way, right? It's something that ha happens involuntarily, uh, which is really really important when we are in need to survive something. Okay. So the last thing we'll talk about is just the evolutionary theory of emotion, and when we think about emotion and how we experience emotion, it's really important to think about. Um, why, right? Emotions are an adaptive piece. We use emotions to uh, get us through things, right? Uh, if I didn't have any emotion, if I didn't feel fear, um, then I wouldn't know that that dog that's growling at me and showing its teeth uh, is dangerous, and I would not respond, and I wouldn't be fearful, I wouldn't be anxious, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't run, right? Or I wouldn't fight back, right? So I have to be able to. Uh, use those emotions to protect myself and to survive situations, right? Uh, if, I, if I'm in a, in a confrontation with someone and um, I don't know he's upset with me and I don't fight back, then I get hurt, then I, I'm killed, right, in battle. Um, if I'm, you know, married and I can't understand that my wife is happy with me and she wants to engage in uh, intercourse, and I don't have those emotions to to um, not don't get excited for that, then I can't survive, right? So Darwin, back in 1872, he believed that our emotions are developed because they have adaptive value. They help us to survive. They help us to adapt to certain situations, and those emotions that maintain that are are maintained, and the ones those primary emotions are the ones that help us to better. Uh, adapt to and survive certain situations. So, you know, again, evolutionary theories, again, consider emotions to be really largely innate reactions to certain stimuli, external and internal, and they have evolved, um, you know, before the thought originates, right, in the cortical regions, it is the subcortical, right, and that's kind of a, the, uh, you know, the hypothalamus and the limbic system, those things were the most primitive parts of the brain. Uh, the folds and things on the outside of the brain, those are things that, you know, matured a lot later. But, you know, the hypothalamus is on the inside near the, the brain stem, the thalamus, the limbic system. Those things are innate, right? Uh, animals sense they have emotions, right? They they're, they get sad. Uh, they're happy, right? And so they don't have the thought process that we have and they don't have the complex thought processes. So, so it is largely innate. You know, those subcortical regions, brain structures like the hypothalamus, most of the limbic system, those evolved before anything else, before thought did. And so that kind of leads to that, that the theory that the evolution is extremely innate um, to the life and what we experience. Um, there are three leading theorists, um, Sylvan Tompkins, Carol Izzard, and Robert Plutchett. And they concluded that we exhibit around eight to 10 primary emotions. And we look at the emotion wheel uh, a few slides back, and we looked at about seven of the core. Uh, so the fundamental emotions that they mentioned were uh, fear, anger, uh, and they all listed out a few of their own, and they agreed upon several. 
right? But fear, anger, enjoyment, disgust, interest, surprise, contempt, shame, uh, guilt, distress, et cetera, those are some of the major uh, and fundamental emotions that we experience uh, and have been studied over the course of time and uh, have been confirmed. Um, but when you think about those primary emotions, then you have to also think about uh, when we think about that, that emotion wheel, um, the, the intricate pieces as we detail all the different emotions out further out. Uh, so, you know, guilt might feel like guilt or sadness, but there's also some other things like shame, and, uh, you know, uh, all those other different on the outer edges, those detailed um, descriptions of different emotions that we feel um, surprised and um, annoyed and frustrated or other kind of uh, feelings that we feel outside of those primary emotions that we've talked about. But, you know, as we talk about emotions, again, like I talked about before, and the intelligence of our emotions are important. How we feel is controlled by so many different things. Uh, our facial expressions, uh, our situational cues, and we have to and must uh, be really mindful of what our emotions are doing to us physically, uh, what they are doing to us uh, mentally, we have control over them if we want to have control over them. And uh, those who have high emotional intelligence are able to control them, um, do a lot better uh, with uh, their job prospects. They do a lot better with um, school. You know, so being able to control your emotions helps you to get through life uh, a lot better and uh, leads to a better life in the long run. OK, uh, but we'll end there. Um, here after a knowledge check, it says, which in which theory of emotion would you feel afraid of something because you are trembling, right? So this means that the uh, physical response is happening before you uh, you do the cognitive uh, appraisal of it. And that would be the James uh, Lang theory, right? So the emotion is indicated. You would feel afraid of something because you are trembling. And so the autonomic arousal and results in that conscious feeling or that kind of appraisal that you do. Okay. So we'll end there. Um, you know, this is really, really important, you know, to think about your self-assessment. You know, can you differentiate between the different theories of motivation, the drive theory, uh, the incentive theory? You know, what are the motivational factors of hunger? Think, talk about the social, uh, the so, you know, the social cues. Talk about the, uh, you know, palatability, eating, um, you know, eating around people, variety of foods. Um, can you describe the human sexual response? Those four uh, very important cycles, the stages, right, of excitement and plateau and orgasm and resolution, be able to be able to explain those things in detail. Um, and, you know, the evolutionary analysis of sexual motivation, why are men and women very different in how they view um, the sexual uh, sex in general, right? How did McClellan measure the motivation to achieve, right? Uh, with, you know, the TAT and uh, uh, those motives, why, why uh, do we have those, those motives to achieve, um, you know, the, 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 the level of motivation that someone has, the, um, the, the ease or the difficulty in achieving something, and then the uh, incentive value, you know, those, those situational factors of motivation. And then, Compare the cognitive, uh, the physiological components of emotion uh, and the behavioral as well, you know, with facial expression, how those play a role and how we move and, and how we experience emotion as well. Here's a summary of things that you should be able to do, um, you know, having gone through these slides. Um, but again, think through these, uh, use these as a study, a studying tip point, um, go through, be able to, uh, to get through these pretty seamlessly um, as you study for the exams coming up. But again, thank you so much. Again, motivation and motivation, two extremely important topics when we talk about life and living a, a life of um, uh, satisfaction and uh, peace. Your emotions play a big role in that and and uh, how you move and how, you, how you're able to experience life in, in a different way. So um, you know, have a good one and we'll see you the next time around.